Electric motors are everywhere, from a fuel pump at a gas station, to a remote controlled car, to the fan inside your computer. If you want to control a motor from a microcontroller, there are a few things you need to keep in mind. Let's go over the basics of DC motors, including back EMF, resistive, and inductive effects, and see how those affect the design of a motor control circuit. If we have a motor, put a voltage across it, the motor will spin. But if we put a switch in series with the motor, we'll only be applying power when the switch is closed. So things get interesting once we let the microcontroller control the switch. Let's think about what the technical requirements are for the switch. In order to get there, let's take a quick look at the motor, which is just a generic brush DC motor we bought. Here's a quick look at another motor disassembled. And you can see the contacts, the brushes, the rotor, and the coils, and you can see the permanent magnets inside the casing. Here are a few experiments and observations that you should really try for yourself. Observation number one. When I spin it by hand, I get a voltage. Guess what? This is how a generator works. This voltage is called the back EMF and it's proportional to the speed. If you remember back to a physics class, this voltage comes about because the permanent magnets in the motor are moving with respect to the motor coils. Number two. We can even attach an LED here and spin it and see that we can light it up. Number three. Now, you can see when I spin it, it keeps spinning for a second or two, even after my finger disconnects from the gear, just because of inertia. Number four. But now, if I put a wire between the two motor terminals, shorting it out, and now I try spinning it, it's actually harder to turn, and also doesn't spin freely anymore. This might be hard to see in the video, but if you've never tried this before, give it a shot. You'll be surprised how much different the little wire makes. Number five, we can measure the resistance of the coils. We get about nine ohms. A little trick we can do is to just measure the resistance of the multimeter leads and subtract that from our earlier measurement. Number six, we can take our full size multimeter, put it on the 10 amp max current measuring mode and wire it in series with the motor. You might think that we take the nine volts of the power supply and divide by nine ohms of the motor resistance and get about an amp but when we actually measure it, we get a much smaller current, only about 0.06 amps when the motor is running with no load. That's because of the back EMF we talked about earlier, which means that as the motor spins faster, there's actually a voltage drop due to the electromagnetic and mechanical work being done. So there's less current drawn from the power supply. Number seven, when I first connect it, the current is higher. It's hard to see because it blinks on the multimeter pretty quick, but it's at least 0.13 amps for one reading. Number eight, the one amp number does actually represent the stall current, which is the current of the motor when it's not spinning. If I actually prevent it from spinning with my hand, connect the power supply, you'll see I do get up to about 0.8 amps. This is still less than the one amp, but that's because the power supply is starting to limit the current now. Only try this for a few seconds because you don't want the motor to overheat. Also, only do it with a small motor like this where you aren't gonna hurt yourself and where it's not mechanically hooked up to anything else. And finally, number nine. When I touch the wires together, I get a small spark. Might be tough to see on the video, but it's there. Even a small spark means big voltages, hundreds or thousands of volts. So with those nine observations, we can now try to build a simple electrical model of the motor. First, we've got a voltage source. This represents the back EMF, and is proportional to the speed. Then we have a resistor, this represents the resistance of the wires inside the motor. And finally, we have an inductor. This represents the energy stored in the magnetic field, and that's the reason for the spark. This model actually explains all the nine observations, and now that we have this model, we can take it and figure out how to switch this motor on and off. Basically, we have two major things to worry about. The first is the maximum current through the switch. Even though we only measured a no-load current of 0.06 amps, if the motor is working under a load, it's going to have a higher current. And when it's first starting up, it's going to have the stall current of 0.8 amps or 2 amps. If we only worry about the 0.06 amps of no load current like we measured, we're going to have all kinds of problems where either the motor won't start or the motor switch will overheat. So it's important to take into account the full maximum current 
that your motor could experience when you're designing your circuit. The second thing to worry about is that there's an inductor here. Basically, when the motor's working as normal, there's no problem. The current's flowing here. But when the switch is opened, the inductor doesn't want its current to change instantaneously. So it'll make a huge voltage here until you get a spark that crosses the gap. And that's what we saw earlier during our experiments. But that spark and these high voltages can damage any other components in the circuit. We can actually fix this problem by adding one diode in parallel with the motor, but in reverse. A diode only lets current flow in one direction. So when the motor's on as normal, it's not doing anything. But when this switch is opened and this voltage starts to rise, this diode will start to turn on and will allow current to flow in this loop. This prevents the voltage from getting dangerously high and protects your components down here. This diode is called a flyback diode in this configuration, and this is an important part of driving any inductive load. Like we talk about in the NerdKit's guide, a transistor can act as a voltage-controlled switch, and for now we're going to use these 2N7000 MOSFETs that are included in the USB NerdKit. Relays can also be used to control motors, but they have some advantages and disadvantages of their own, and we'll have to cover those in a later video. When we put 5 volts on the gate of the 2N7000, we're basically choosing to operate along this curve. So we get a maximum current of about 3 fourths of an amp. With this and the flyback diode, we've got a shot at controlling the motor by using the MOSFET in place of the switch we were drawing earlier. One more thing. We're going to add a resistor between the gate and ground. This is just for those occasional times when the microcontroller isn't driving this pin like when we're in programming mode and we want the motor to stay off. If we make this a 100k resistor, that's gentle enough to pull the gate to ground without interfering with normal operation. So this is our whole switching circuit. We've got the motor, the MOSFET, the flyback diode, and a pull-down resistor. So here's the first demo. A few lines of code that read from a push button, debounce it, and toggle the motor on and off each time I press. And here's another quick demo with speed control using pulse width modulation, PWM. We can let the microcontroller turn the MOSFET on and off very quickly as a way to adjust the speed. We've got the temperature sensor hooked up as the control signal. So as it gets hotter, the motor spins faster. As you can imagine, this might be useful for a cooling fan. We can talk more about pulse width modulation in a few of our other videos, so please take a look for a better understanding. I hope this video gives you an idea of how to get started controlling motors with the microcontroller. This is just the start, and the topic goes a lot deeper. If you're still curious and want more things to think about, consider power dissipation of the MOSFET, the diode reverse recovery time, gate capacitance, turn on, turn off times, all of the issues like that, and that's before we even get to each bridges and switch in the direction of the motor. So it might sound like there's a lot to think about, and there is, but it all starts with the tools you've learned in this video just turning a motor on and off. As always, you can find the source code and more information at our website at www.nerdkits.com. And please send us some feedback, let us know how you're working motors into your projects, and let me know if you've learned anything from this video.